So for all you math lovers out there, we're actually going to get into some equations a bit more heavily. Uh, you do need to make note that these equations work for constant acceleration only, so we will need to pay attention to that. Basically, we're not going to give you problems where you don't have constant acceleration, but just so you know, uh, for future studies, I guess, you can have changing acceleration, and the rate of change of acceleration is called the jerk. So you could derive similar kinematic equations for constant jerk or uh, changing jerk or any of those things. But here we're assuming constant acceleration. Uh, in fact, the first situation we're going to look at is constant velocity, which is technically constant acceleration, right? It's just a constant value of zero, and that's okay. And we already saw what the equation is for constant velocity motion related to your position. There's only one equation, uh, but I wanted to show you how that equation jumps right out from these graphs um, so that we get a bit of a flavor for how we're going to derive these other uh, non-zero acceleration equations. So we already know that the slope on our position time graph gives us our velocity, the value of our velocity, and we can see how we get our equation uh, for distance and velocity from this. So to find slope, just your basic algebraic formula, it's rise over run. Everybody loves algebra, right? Well, the rise is from here up to here. Now this is where you end up. So we call that x for your final position. And where you start out, we call that x naught. So your rise is x minus x naught, the difference between those positions. Now, some other texts might use xf for final and xi for initial. Uh, I prefer to just have uh, no subscript for any final values. And we use a zero, or not, n-a-u-g-h-t, to represent the value of that variable at time zero. All right, so there's the rise. The run is going this way, which is just time t. Technically, it's a delta t, but t initial is zero, so we can just have the final time there. Now this slope we said is equal to the velocity, so here's our equation. Often we combine this final minus initial here into a delta x over t equals v, and then we rearrange, we multiply the t over, and so we get delta x equals vt just by knowing that the slope on a position time graph tells us velocity. Now if we go here to the velocity time graph, I have this quantity v times t. Well, if I multiply v, which is this, okay, times t, which is that, that is just the height and the width of this rectangle. So if I multiply v times t, I get the area of that rectangle. And v times t has to be equal to delta x. So just conceptually, this is an important thing to know, that the area on a velocity graph tells you the displacement. So what I'm saying is you can go back and forth between these two graphs. Slope takes you this way, area takes you this way. In calculus terms, the derivative of the position function gives you the velocity function, and the area is given by the integral, so the integral of the velocity function will take you back to the position function. Now, we're not going to use calculus, you don't have to know that, but for those of you who are familiar with it, it's good to know uh, how those relationships work. All right, moving on to non-zero acceleration, but we're assuming it is still constant. So if I start out, I, I don't start out at zero velocity here, I have a little bit of velocity, and I am speeding up. So that's why my slope is increasing. You can see that here. My velocity is increasing at a constant rate, which means I have a constant value for my acceleration, or I've got a horizontal graph. So we can play these um, same games that we played on that other graph. Let's start out by looking at this. Um, the slope of this line tells us the acceleration. So we can get an equation from that, just like the slope of this is velocity. The slope of velocity is acceleration because we said acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So that slope is, again, rise over run, so final velocity minus initial velocity over the run, which is the time, 
is equal to a, and we saw this equation already. This simplifies. Uh, actually, I'm not going to combine this into a delta v. You can if you like, but often we write this as uh, if I multiply the t across, I've got v minus v naught equals a t, and then we move the v naught to the other side, and we say v equals v naught plus a t. Same thing as a equals delta v over t, just rearranged a bit. So this is our first uh, kinematic equation that we're going to use for accelerating reference frames. Okay, And you can see a similar thing here. If we have A times T, well that's going to give us this area here, right? The area of this rectangle, A times T. And A times T is going to equal delta V, uh, which is essentially this equation here, right? Before we rearranged it. So uh, we see that delta V is the area on an acceleration graph. So hopefully you see the pattern, right? Slopes take you this way, and areas take you this way. I'll write that up here. So slopes go that way, areas go this way. Again, in calculus terms, derivatives go this way, integrals go this way. So you can say that acceleration is the second derivative of your position function. All right, now we want to get another equation. So it's still true that the area of this guy is the, uh, I'm going to erase this stuff here. Oh, no, the eraser doesn't work. Uh, here, grab that eraser and just kind of get some room here. All right, so the area of this guy does still represent the displacement, even though we don't have a constant velocity. Uh, to find that area, it makes sense to break this up into a rectangle and a triangle. Sorry, my lines aren't all that straight. So the area still represents, um, coming over here now, still represents the displacement. So the area of this triangle, it is the height here, which is final velocity and initial velocity, if I label those there. We're going to have the one-half base times height for the area of this triangle, so one-half times the base, which is t, times the height, which is v minus v naught, for that quantity there. Okay, then we need the area of this rectangle, <coughs> which is just going to be v naught times t, its length times its height. Uh, now we can substitute in, I mean this equation here is valid, but usually we substitute in, if we think of this equation here, I've got v minus v naught over t equals a. So I can multiply the t over and I can get a times t is equal to v minus v naught. So I can substitute in a t for that v minus v naught. And then we can combine those t's so we've got one half a t squared and not that it matters but usually when this equation is written the v naught term is written first so here is our second equation your displacement is your initial velocity times your time plus one half acceleration times time squared alright two down two to go uh, let's jump over to a clean screen here. <clears throat> now let's look at this graph here for a minute again. Um, if we think about the slope on this, the slope does still represent the velocity at every point along the function, but that velocity is changing. So I can't just say, oh, find the slope of this guy. Uh, but what I can do is I can say, well, on an interval from here to here, I've got to variety of velocities, but if I draw a straight line, let me grab my straight line because I'm not great at drawing straight lines. If I draw a straight line through those two points, well the slope of that line is the average velocity between those two times, so on this time interval here. Okay, I'll better grab the pen again. So our equation where we had delta x equals vt well, that is still true for this graph as long as we understand that that v is the average, which again we indicate with a bar over the quantity. 
So this is still true. Now how do we write the average velocity in terms of initial and final velocities? Um, well, my initial velocity, if I'm kind of considering the same time interval here, this would be V naught, and this would be V, just the values there, right? I mean, the think about it as their values over here along the v-axis. Well, the average is just the point right in the middle, so you can do a simple average. So we can have v plus v naught over 2. That is our average velocity as long as we have constant acceleration. So this is a linear relationship here. And so we have that multiplied by t. All right? Equation numero 3, number 3 here. All right, one to go, and we're actually going to use this equation. I'm going to rewrite it, uh, just this part of the equation, on a blank screen here. So we've got delta x equals v plus v naught over 2 times t, and we are going to combine that with our first equation, which was v plus, or, sorry, erase. Uh, v equals v naught plus a t. Now you could do a number of substitutions to get different equations, uh, but I'll show you at the end why there's these four equations that are particularly useful. So anyway, if we start with these two guys here, and if I solve this equation here for t, I'm just going to kind of quickly do it. You'd uh, put the v naught on the other side, divide by a, so you'd have v minus v naught over a is equal to t. Now if I substitute in this quantity for that t over there, I'm going to get delta x equals v plus v naught over 2. Then instead of writing t, I'm going to write this guy, so v minus v naught over a. And that's really it. These are the quantities we want in there. Now we just need to simplify. Uh, it's easiest if we multiply both sides by 2 and a to just get rid of those denominators. So we're going to have 2a delta x is equal to v plus v naught times v minus v naught. Okay, and then if we go ahead and multiply <coughs> all of this out, we're going to have 2a delta x equals v squared from the first terms. Uh, the cross terms cancel out, right? Because you've got v naught v positive and v naught v negative. And then you're going to have minus v naught squared. Usually this is rearranged. So we get v squared equals our initial velocity squared plus 2a delta x. And there we have it, folks. Equation number four. And if we look at all of these in same time now. <clears throat> Here we have our four equations and as I mentioned you can substitute them in and get other equations but these four are particularly useful for the types of problems we will be dealing with. Uh, if you look here each of these equations is missing a specific variable. So this guy doesn't have displacement, this guy has initial velocity but he doesn't have final velocity. Uh, this guy does not have acceleration and this guy doesn't have time. So in the types of problems we'll solve, typically you're given some information, uh, some information you won't know anything about, and some information you'll be asked to find. And it's that information that you don't know anything about and that you're not trying to find that often informs you which equation, oh that was bad, <laughs> which equation is going to be most useful uh, for solving that problem given the information you have and what you're looking for.